Hello, welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Today's date is the 17th of April 2014. Welcome to any new listeners, uh, thanks to existing ones again. Truth Sentinel, as I mentioned before, is on the move. We've been through Netherlands, Turkey, we're now in Ukraine. Uh, we've been doing a few interviews over here, just settling in at the moment really. Um, today's news, uh, weather blights South Korea ferry search. There's uh, obviously a ferry that's gone down uh, near South Korea. Uh, 300 piece people were missing. Uh, there's, um, there are uh, survivors, but still plenty of people missing there in that tragedy. Um, back to the Ukraine situation. Ukrainian, Russian and Western diplomats have held talks in Switzerland today, um, hoping to resolve the crisis that uh, seems to be happening in Ukraine uh, with armed pro-Russian protesters uh, seething, seizing parts of uh, eastern Ukraine. At the moment we're okay here in Odessa although um, we have heard that things could start to happen here shortly. It really depends. Um, nobody knows what's going to happen next really. Uh, Putin's very cautious on using force in Ukraine, I've read, but he said it's um, it's an exercise that his it's his right to do, to send troops into Ukraine um, as the talks are going on, continue to go on in Geneva. On the MH370 um, search, the mini-sub is still um, looking around trying to locate those signals, which could have been anything. Um, today, as mentioned in um, a little trailer I did, we're going to have um, an interview with Sarah Bajak, um, partner of Philip Wood, so that will come later on in today's episode. Uh, we're grateful for her uh, coming to talk to us. Um, prosecu prosecutors um, have launched a trial in the US for, uh, for uh, against Abu Hamza, who uh, it took about I think about 10 years or more to kick him out of uh, England for um, preaching a lot of hate speech over here. Uh, in the week's news, um, Berlusconi um, is going to be doing community service. That should be interesting. The ex-PM of uh, Italy there. Uh, ordered to do one year's community service over tax fraud. Uh, that's what the courts ruled anyway. It remains to be seen what will happen with that. A girl was um, allegedly arrested for tweeting a bomb threat. Um, basically, she uh, threatened uh, or said that there was a bomb and um, it was taken quite seriously. And there's, uh, it was said on the news that she was arrested anyway. Now, it might not be long before anti-government comments could get you arrested or certain opinions will get you arrested. Uh, that's certainly something to watch out for anyway. It's already been happening in some cases. Um, of course, there was the anniversary of the marathon uh, in Boston. Um, I believe that's already taken place. That was uh, the, the week's news. Um, there's also a blood moon. Uh, did anyone see the blood moon? I didn't get the chance to see that. Back to the um, Oscar Pistorius trial. Um, we're only casually uh, following it because it's... Um, it's not really a conspiracy or anything that we need to investigate too much, but it is quite interesting. I mean, if some of the other stories in the news were put through the same analysis, then we might get to the truth more often. But mainstream news is, um, in some cases, um, not doing that. In other cases, they are. I mean, I still use the BBC, CNN um, and other uh, sources of media to get um, some news details. Some of it's correct. Some of it, I just think, could be... Um, it could, there could be more investigative journalism. It seems to have disappeared from some forms of media. Um, and if anyone questions an, an event, they're branded as a conspiracist. You know, um, that's the problem. We're, a lot of people are being branded uh, conspiracy theorists now, uh, when most of the time it's just people who are asking questions, that's all. Um, 200 schoolgirls were uh, reported abducted in Nigeria. That sounds quite frightening. Um, in an attack on a school in north and eastern uh, Nigeria. Uh, that's what the parents said over there. I think it was a place called Chibok in uh, Borno State. And they put all these girls onto lorries and have taken them away. Last time I checked, um, they, they hadn't heard any more on where, their whereabouts. 
but um, they're thought to be from the Islamic group Boko Haram. Last um, last uh, episode of Truth Sentinel, we talked about uh, Malaysian flight MH370, Ukraine, some other general news, Harp, Turkey, and we talked about assassins, government assassins. Um, we'll move on to the main part of today's program in a moment. Remember to leave any um, ideas for topics in the comments section. We may not do them straight away, but they will be added to the list of things that we want to look at if it's something we feel is worth checking out. I do definitely, I read the comment section. And I do take notice of what's in there. Remember also that we'd like to hear from you if you're a listener. We can have a, sh a short sort of two or three minute Skype chat and we can make a collage of uh, just your opinions on anything that's brought up in the episodes or anything you want to say. We'll make, a, we'll make a, one episode where we have maybe a collage of some of those. Um, let's move on to the main part of the show, the search for MH370. Um, it's been in the news for a long time, I know, but we do have um, Sarah with us today, uh, Sarah Bajak. Uh, the interview will be coming later, uh, just as a bit of background chat about that. Let's just see what we know. Uh, the plane allegedly changed course because new coordinates were programmed into the computer by someone with knowledge of aviation flight computers. This is some of the information I've been looking at the internet. Um, it could have been, uh, could this have been done remotely by a hacker, either on the plane or on the ground? Um, either way, it seems it was deliberately diverted for whatever reason. There's definitely questions that should be asked and it's not being tackled enough. The questions, not all the questions have been asked on mainstream news. They are on some. Um, the last words were from the co-pilot, Farik Abdul Hamid. Uh, so it's possible he's involved in some way or other, whether in a bad way or, you know, he may have even tried to save people, who knows, but he was involved, he was the last voice that was heard. The plane uh, allegedly flew on for um, up to five to seven hours, uh, flying over a number of countries, all supposedly undetected. I think that sounds very unlikely. Uh, although there are reports I saw on the internet that the Thai Air Force said its radar spotted MH370 uh, 370 heading to the Strait of Malacca minutes after it managed, vanished, but it didn't really say much more than that. Um, one of the passengers allegedly gave his ring and watch to family in case he didn't came, come back, which sounds a bit curious. There was also talk of the pilot and the co-pilot um, having mysterious phone calls before takeoff, etc. Um, I think the plane was um, almost certainly picked up by military radar, but we haven't mu uh, heard much about that, a radar or satellite. Our attention was initially um, diverted to objects photographed with blurry satellite images, not the clear ones we've been led to believe are possible, such as the ones shown of uh, Russian planes on the border of Ukraine. Although those, uh, those pictures have incidentally possibly uh, outdated themselves. Then we were told there was pings from black boxes, although definitely um, not definitely coming from the plane. These have since disappeared. It does seem like a real wild goose chase. It, it reminds me of a kind of um, uh, episodes of Lost, the uh, TV series Lost, like you just want to see the next one to see what's going to happen next and nothing quite happens, but uh, and you're not quite sure what the conclusion is, so you watch the next one. Uh, that's what it reminds me of. Um, all, always seeming to point towards a conclusion, but never actually getting there. We won't talk about the finale of Lost, of course. Some people liked it. Um, as I said, the sad part is that um, any ideas that differ from the official story are deemed conspiracy uh, theories by some. And that's the kind of attitude we need to try to change. Um, I mean, there are some theories that might be seen as ridiculous, but I, I really try and shy away from using that word because everything should be considered. It should be, it should be um, fairly easy to eliminate the ridiculous stories, um, but people do need to ask questions and not try and shut people down who do ask questions. I mean... Um, Conspiracy things that were originally seen as conspiracy theories have turned out to be true. 
I mean, people's minds being wiped by the CIA? Ridiculous nonsense. Um, actually, no. Uh, there's people uh, who've sued, this, sued the CIA, and it's admitted by the CIA that that went on in the past. Planes flown into two towers in New York. Not nonsense, that happened. We all know that. MI5, KGB, CIA, uh, secret uh, organizations doing secret covert operations. That's not nonsense. We all know that that goes on. False flag starting wars. Um, look at the Gulf of Tonkin incident in, uh, regarding Vietnam. Um, misinfo, uh, which was apparently misinfo spread by the NSA. UFOs being witnessed by hundreds of people in Phoenix, Nevada. Not nonsense. There was uh, hundreds of people who saw that. They should be listened to. Uh, Mothman seen in West Virginia. Um, not nonsense. Uh, that was uh, that character was seen by quite a number of people. So in a court of law, that would have been something that you would have said happened. Um, the CIA used false witness accounts of kill, uh, the killing of newborn babies to wage war with Iraq. Not nonsense, that happened. And if you think about how disgusting that is, that um, they used that story and it was, um, it was not true, then that's, you know, that should give you some idea of the mentality of some of these people. CIA influencing national media towards hatred and fear of Soviet communism in the 50s. Uh, that happened. Um, asbestos was originally said to be safe, turned out later it wasn't, due to people questioning, basically, questioning the facts. There's a, there's a special heart attack gun that the CIA invented that fires a bullet made of ice that can disappear inside and leave no trace, uh, um, so thereby killing uh, the person that is shot at. That's true, check that out if you want. Cancer DNA, DNA viruses in poli polio vaccines. Uh, 98 million Americans received one of those uh, within an eight year period. And um, there's a, a poly, polyoma virus called SV40 inside uh, the polio vaccine. And it's estimated that, um, that it's, it's said that that is, um, can cause cancer uh, according to tests. Human animal hybrids being created globally, that's happening. Please do your own research, check out if you're not sure about that. Um, regarding um, the global elite wanting to reduce human population on the planet, people like David Rockefeller, Prince Philip, um, they've open, openly said that they want that to happen. Um, also, um, people like Ted Turner, who said uh, a total world population of 250 to 300 million people um, a 95% decline from present levels would be ideal. Uh, this That ties in with the Georgia Guidestones that we talked about. Okay, whatever you think of Alex Jones, he also said that um, the NSA was spying on all our phone calls, internet searches, financial tracks, transactions. That turned out to be true. Also, Ed, uh, Edward Snowden revealed um, a lot about the NSA and what um, their spying um, that they've been doing on us. Uh, so, <clears throat> anyway, back to MH370. It's important because um, the lies and deceptions in the past, we need to make sure that people do question, get to the truth. Don't just let stories disappear from the news and pass us by. There are, there are some reports that MH370 was flown in such a way as to avoid radar quite low at high speed. There's so many stories about this plane, it's just, it must be very difficult for members of the family to actually follow. I had a chance to speak to Sarah Bajak, partner of Philip Wood, one of the passengers that many people may be familiar with um, because of various conspiracy theories. And we you know we don't believe all of them. I mean, it, I think that photograph, um, I'm a bit dubious about that, to be honest. And we did, I did speak to Sarah about that, or we did discuss that. So um, let's go and listen to the interview. Um, thanks again to Sarah for talking to us. Um, and here is the interview. My guest today is Sarah Bajak. Her partner, Philip Wood, was a passenger on Malaysian flight MH370, which, as you know, um, has disappeared. I saw um, Sarah being interviewed on TV and I was particularly impressed with how she's dealing with this situation in continuing to question the official account at the same time staying logical, remaining hopeful amidst, amidst um, continually changing news surrounding the mysterious disappearance. 
One thing I would like to ask listeners before I start is that we can all continue to dig for information, ensure that every avenue is investigated by members of the public and anyone involved with the independent media. Um, we're grateful for Sarah spending time with us today on today's show and want to support her in any way we can during this time and let her know that she's not going through this alone but people are thinking of her and other passengers' families. Hello Sarah, thanks for coming on to Truth Sentinel. Thank you for having me on your show, Scott. You're most welcome. Um, let me start with my first question. Um, you have a lot of support from people around the world, including me and listeners of Truth Sentinel. Are you finding any comfort from the support? Yes, of course. Um, I mean, not only in a, in a concrete visual way of being able to hear people or visual and audio way of being able to hear people and see people giving their support and and validating that you're not crazy to continue to hope and and pray for a positive outcome but also the the softer side of it i i really do believe in the power of human connection and so you know when you can raise thousands and hundreds of thousands of voices towards a po towards a positive aim so on, on many levels i think it's very important yeah um i mean i totally understand why you're hold, holding out hope because um for an emotional point of view that's that's important and at the end of the day nothing's been found still to this day so yeah, I think you've got every right to hold, hold on to some hope. Yeah, we're at uh, almost day 40, just a couple more hours and we'll be at that cross. And there is not a single piece of concrete evidence. And the only circumstantial evidence we have has been, um, has gone through a very weak chain of command. So it's been passed through the Malaysian government, which means we no longer have confidence that it hasn't been altered in some way before analysis has taken place. So it, I, I believe I speak on behalf of most of the families when I say that I have basically zero confidence in the projections and pronouncements that the Malaysian government has given to us. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, I've noticed from your Facebook page, you, um, you've, you've been writing messages to Philip and you seem to have quite a special relationship. Can you tell us something about how you met and um, what makes your relationship so close? Well, we met a couple of years ago. Um, we had each basically ended long-term marriages, so my divorce was actually already final after 22 years and uh, he was formally separated and initiating a divorce after 25 years with his ex-wife and we just kind of ran into each other by accident and kept a friendship at just the beginning i think we were both a little bit raw around the edges and then it, it developed into something more and it it, it sounds strange I'm, I'm not a an overly metaphysical person. I'm, I'm, uh, I teach business and economics. I had a 22-year career in business. Most people would tell you that I'm an extraordinarily logical and pragmatic person. But, you know, at the age of 46, hmm. which was two years ago for me, um, I found my soulmate and he felt the same way. And so, you know, you go through you know, several decades of, you know, raising children and figuring out how life works. And then all of a sudden you have this epiphany of what happiness really means. And now just, you know, two and a half short years later, all of a sudden it's been kind of dashed. It's a, it's a, a bit of a traumatic experience, but, um, but I, I, I still believe that that connection is existing. So I, I just have to hope that we can continue to push for the truth in solving this just ungodly mystery. Yeah, would you say that you're becoming more of a spiritual person? Well, I, I consider myself to have always been a very spiritual person. Um, Philip also 
is a very spiritual person. He was raised in, in quite a religious family. Uh, I, I think he embodies his faith um, very deeply um, in his heart. And uh, I, I think my path is a little less traditional, but no less deep. And it was a component of our relationship to be able to connect at that level that goes beyond what you normally experience with people in, in normal relationships. And, and it gives you an inkling into the kinds of things that are maybe possible through the human spirit and whether that's enabled through a higher power or just in our own humanity, I, I can't make that decision, but, um, you know, Philip called it quantum entanglement, you know, that we must have shared some atoms from eons beyond uh, because there was just so many points of connection, it, it can't have been accidental. Um, so you have a special connection, and um, I heard that you were uh, tracking, actually tracking um, Philip uh, during his flight as well. At what stage did you know something was possibly wrong? You know, I, I didn't actually know anything was wrong for sure until several hours after they were supposed to have landed. Um, usually we stay in very close contact during, during transport, either we're traveling together or if we're traveling apart, we check in, you know, right before boarding and we check in again, right when we land, it's a, it's a habit. We, we both travel a good deal. Um, and this, this circumstance was very odd because he checked in with me several hours before he left for the airport, but he was very rushed. There had been some confusion over his flight time. And he'd almost missed the flight, and he didn't check in with me right before boarding, which I thought was so odd. And then, so I went to sleep feeling a little ill at ease, because that wasn't part of our normal habit. And then, you know, I woke up feeling a little ill at ease. I mean, I've got to admit, there, there, were, there were already signs mm. that something was wrong, but I was quite distracted with getting everything packed because we had movers coming that morning. That's why Philip had come in on the red-eye flight, because the movers were supposed to come at 9. So he was supposed to land at 6.30 and be home by 7.38 uh, in order to be here in time for the movers to come with his passport so he could sign off for customs exchange. We're in the process of moving from Beijing to Kuala Lumpur. And, uh, you know, moving between two antagonistic countries is not like moving between... Uh, two cities in England or two cities in the United States. It's a much more complicated process. And uh, he didn't show up and he didn't show up and the driver was waiting for him and the, the uh, pronouncements on the flight board just said the flight was delayed even though it had taken off on time and the delay time extended from one hour to two hours to three hours and then CNN came out with their... Um, their news announcement that the flight was officially declared missing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you uh, you were moving to Malaysia because Philip was going to start a new job, or you were both starting a new job, is that right? Yeah, both of us. So we were ready to leave China. I'd been here for seven years. He'd been here for two and a half. He'd already stayed an extra year um, to be with me while my youngest son was finishing high school here. And so uh, he, he, he was still with the same company, but he was taking a new posting in KL, which started in February. So we'd taken an apartment there in January. And uh, he was to come back here for the month of March to start by getting the shipment on board, I mean, on the boat, and then just to hang out here with, uh, with my son and I for a couple of weeks. And then... We were all to return to KL for a week of spring break. So my son and I and Philip together, uh, which um, we did without him. So I was there two weeks ago to finish settling the apartment and take care of closing out his things at his employer, uh, who is, I think, all too ready to put this to bed. It's too much of a hassle for them to deal with. Mm -hmm. Um 
And now I'm back uh, here in Beijing because my contract doesn't finish until the end of June. I'm a teacher, so you can't leave your students in the middle of a school year, especially um, I teach graduating classes who are going through exams. So uh, I have a, a very real obligation and, and desire to see it through. I mean, I, I, I owe a lot to my students to um, see them through to good exam results. So, um, so I was to be here through June and then um, would be joining him over the summer. And I have a new position already, already set in KL. Okay. Um, there's been a lot of uh, analysis about the people on the board, including their jobs, and um, one of them was in, re in relation to technology patents. I don't know if you've seen about that. Did um, Philip's job at IBM in involve anything that's likely to connect to these stories? Uh, no, I highly doubt it. Um, uh, Philip was in primarily a business development role. He did have a, a technical background, but um, I can't believe that over the two and a half years that I've known him, that he could have possibly kept any kind of nefarious under undercover background <laughs> secret from me. We lived a pretty consolidated and, uh, and close life together. Um, I, I do find it suspicious, the, the density of intellectual property that was sitting on that airplane, not only in people, but also in uh, patent samples and other things. So that is one of the leading theories, is that the plane was taken for the, um, the valuable assets that were on board. Yeah, uh, and there's a lot of other theories. I, know, I mean, I know um, it seems clear that you don't necessarily believe the account you're being told by Malaysian authorities. Um, there's been a lot of conspiracy theories. Um, I just wondered, you know, with, with places like Diego Garcia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Israel, What's your feeling about these? Do, um, do you find them annoying? Do you prefer, do you prefer not to speculate, speculate about them? How do you feel about them? Well, I listen to all of them and I try to assess them in, um, intellectually. So from an analytical perspective, there are some that seem to be more valid than others, but there's no one that comes forth as the obvious choice. Um, it, there are certain of the theories that have surfaced, like uh, there was one about Philip sending a text message, a black picture. Yeah, mm -hmm. That one is clearly fake. Um, I mean, even without knowing Philip, any intelligent person can look at the content of that message and say, hmm. Yeah, I, I, mm -hmm. I, yeah absolutely. I, I, I must admit, the, the things that were said in that message, it, just, it sounds almost like a joke, you know. Yeah, like perfect grammar, perfect spelling, capitalization and punctuation. You know, somebody who's blindfolded and drugged knows that their captors are military people. I mean, really, come on. I mean, you know, but, but separate from that, the reality is, is that uh, Philip and I texted and Skyped and every other means of communication back and forth with each other on a regular basis, sometimes hourly. And uh, he never would have written something so structured and formal. It would have been very ad hoc. So in a time of crisis, that would have been worse, not better. And, and there's no way he would have referred to his employer before he would have referred to me. So, I, I mean, I'm sure that's a hoax. Now, is Diego Garcia involved? I don't know. I, I mean, I'm an American. I, I like to think that my country would not be involved in something like this um, and that it seems too far-fetched for that airplane to have been landed on that island. But the reality is, you know, the United States, just like many other countries, has been involved in some pretty awful stuff over the last, oh, couple hundred years, right? Yeah, There's, yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of bad behavior by bad people. It doesn't mean the United States is a bad place. I love my country. I'm proud to be an American. But the reality is we have had some pretty scary stuff happen. You know, whether that's, you know, in recent times, the, the cover-ups and the 9-11 um, escapade, you know, the things that led up to the whole Iraq war issue and, and what Bush was fabricating there. You know, you've got... in further history, you've got the Vietnam era, you've got the Iran-Contra scenarios, Watergate, I mean, you name it, 
there's been bad people doing bad things. So um, it, it's always a possibility. I mean, there's no proof. Um, the government certainly has not come forward with any kind of defense or proof to the contrary. So we have to keep that as an open possibility. And uh, I heard on CNN that you mentioned about the possibility there might have been jet fighters tailing the plane. Um, are you still um, sticking to that? I mean, did, did you get any information about that at all? I've not been able to validate that. That was purely a statement made by one of the family members um, at the um, family briefing in Kuala Lumpur that I had gone to a couple weeks ago, which is the only one I've ever gone to. I've never gone to any of them here in Beijing. I, I do live in Beijing, China. Um, I, I prefer to steer clear of that media circus. Um, and I didn't go to any of the other um, uh, gatherings in KL either for much the same reason. It, it's interesting because I've done a lot of uh, international press. I mean, I'm all over uh, CNN and NBC and ABC and CBS and the Wall Street Journal and, and now your show as well. Uh, but the reality is, in China and in Malaysia, very few people are watching the international news. So uh, I can be quite anonymous. I mean, I have absolutely no concern about being recognized walking down the street <laughs> here in Beijing or even in KL. Um, but if I would have shown up at any of those conferences, then I would have been recognized because the local media pay attention to those. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I wanted to ask you about your feelings about, you know, the search is uh, currently being investigated in the areas with the submersibles, etc. And that was because of the Inmasat um, calculations with the, uh, over the ping data. Um, how do you feel about that situation at the moment? I mean, do you feel that they could have made a miscalculation there? Well, I've been having some exchanges with um, who, I, who I believe to be quite a validated mathematician and uh, he has a, a number of other mathematicians and physicists who work with him in his calculations, but the, his name is Duncan Steele, uh, based out of Australia. And um, according to the data he's been provided, now the big caveat is here that the data he's been provided may or may not be the real data. Right. So we, we don't have any confidence that the data being released for analysis is actually the real raw data because everything is filtering through Malaysia and we don't know what kind of modification they might be making. We are all very, very, very suspect of the Malaysian government at this point. But regardless of the data that he's received, he has challenged the assessments being made that there are some mathematical formula errors, as an example, and that the northern route is just as likely, if not more likely, than the southern route that was uh, determined to be the, the more obvious choice, as evidenced by the, the March 24th pronouncement of the, um, the leaders within Malaysia of saying that the flight was lost and it was in the ocean. So, you know, if we have independent, multiple independent um, experts in the calculation of moving masses through air. So this is what these people specialize in, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're all saying, you know, they've made mistakes in their calculations. Then we should be listening to that. And, um, you know, not only from a purely mathematical model, you know, a, a pure maths modeling perspective, but also just some knowledge of how flight, flight autopilots work that if, you know, separate from the calculations, which could go either way, you know, one of the things that Duncan had stated is he said, look, you know, autopilots are a computer system. And uh, if indeed that computer system went through some catastrophic failure, it would reboot itself, just like anything else reboots itself. You know, your computer, when it gets to the blue screen, it reboots itself. And uh, when a flight uh, data um, autopilot goes through a reboot cycle, it defaults to 360, which happens to be due north. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, separate from the fact that the calculations themselves could go either way, you take that extra piece of data in there and say, hmm, you know, so, so if it was catastrophic failure, north would make more sense than south. 
And if it wasn't catastrophic failure, if it was indeed manned, then North still makes a lot of sense. Because if you're taking a plane for some purpose, why would you just put it into the water? You know, you're going to take it and do something with it. Yeah. Which means you're going to have to put it onto land someplace. And it would have it would have been tracked as well. That's the other curious thing. I mean, it's, it's very unlikely that it's true that it wasn't tracked by anyone. Well, either direction, though, because whether you're going north or south, it still would have flown over airspace of multiple countries, and nobody's saying anything. Yeah, um, and um, when the Malaysians announced that it was uh, that they said the plane had crashed with no survivors, that was very suspect as well. That was really uh, odd. I thought. What did you think when they said that? Uh, I thought it was cruel, and it was clearly intentional to have that impact. I mean, there's no way a normal thinking person attempting to do the right thing would have possibly made that set of statements. You know, they had no fact, um, they had no corroboration from anybody else. They just came out and made the statement. And it, to me, you know, my, my, my immediate impression was to crash because I was already so on the edge anyway that it just kind of tipped me over. But uh, once I'd had a chance to think about it a little bit and talk to people, you know, my, my youngest son is 17 and he's uh, actually much more clear headed, I think, than adults sometimes are. And he said, but you know, mom, they didn't, they didn't tell you anything new. All they did is package it into something that is probably serving their purpose. And so if they're looking to close the inquiry down because they want to settle up with insurance and go about their lives and be done with this hassle, well, then that pronouncement maybe made some sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's very unlikely a plane can fly for five to seven hours without being tracked by radar. I mean, was, was the hijack situation still being considered in the last couple of weeks or has it been totally ruled out now? Well, based on what the officials are doing, I mean, based on the fact that they're exploring only that little piece of the ocean, they seem to have ruled it out. Um, from the standpoint of the families and, you know, the mass support. So, you know, I run a couple of Facebook pages. I've got my own personal page. It's just called Sarah Hamill Bajek. It's my personal communication site for friends and family. And I, I write messages to Philip. It's not news oriented at all. And then... Um, there's another site called Finding Philip Wood, and, and that page is, is quite dedicated to the efforts of discovering the truth. So, you know, we've had almost, I think we're up, I'd have to go back and retotal, but I think it's closing in on, on more than 2 million hits and um, like 36,000 likes in only four weeks. And, and that means we're getting some critical mass of people who are all thinking about this problem. And, and the, the general consensus is that something has been, you know, been pulled over us, that, that there is a, a conspiracy of some sort, you know, even if it's just a cover up incompetence, there's some, there's some cover up of some sort. Yeah, that does seem yes. to be the case. Um, I would imagine if you're getting so many hits to your site, you must, you must be getting contact to, um, both with people who might have some um, valid uh, information, but also maybe people who have coming up with some crazy stories as well. Are you, um, are you, are you finding it easy to sift, sift between those? Well, we have about a dozen volunteers. Um, so it's all a volunteer effort with mostly friends and family um, who do watch the postings. And at the beginning, I'll tell you, the first week or two, we had just a bunch of crazies. I mean you know, psychics trying to sell their services and people trying to scam money and take donations, which our site would never do. We, we accept no donations whatsoever, except in the form of information and help. And um, so we had to shut a bunch of them down. Even a couple of them got reported to the FBI because of their um, egregiousness. But the, the vast majority, I mean, 99.9% are very positive and supportive. And as we're getting further into this mystery, we're starting to get more concrete content. 
So, you know, one of our efforts, it's, it's not just to be a, a social therapy site, which, you know, honestly, at the beginning, it was very useful for that. It, at least for me, I needed a place to have outlet for my emotion. But um, now we're starting to try to gather concrete input. So people who have connections into the government and people who have connections in other countries to please come forward and offer suggestions and offer contacts and connections and even, you know, even just practical help. Like, you know, how do we turn all of this data into a, a readable infographic that people can understand? Well, I don't have the expertise to do that, but we've had a group at one of the local universities in Atlanta volunteer a class, a whole class, like 50 students, of people who specialize in imaging data and um, you know they're working on this as a class project so I mean that's a an example of how people can help that's that's really nice to hear actually that you're getting such positive feedback then that's quite comforting for everyone I think yeah it's it's a way to to find some good out of this terrible mess um, have you heard any particularly um, important news in the last day or so that hasn't been reported on the mainstream news? No. The mainstream news uh, is my news. You know, the reality is I get nothing from the official sources that isn't already on, on CNN or, or somebody else. Okay, and what's your thoughts on the signals that, are, um, that were reported coming from the uh, potential black boxes, but probably could be anything? They seem to have disappeared now and they put the submersibles in. Um, it does seem a bit like a wild goose chase that they keep almost finding something, then not finding something. What's your feeling at this stage? Uh, my feeling has stayed fairly consistent that um, I feel that we are being intentionally misled and guided down a path of... Um, of, of being distracted from the real issue. It's, it's, it's just too perfectly orchestrated to be accidental, you know? Everybody just gives up interest and then some little piece comes to keep us paying attention to this distraction over here on the right, while over here on the left, whatever is really happening is going on. You know, I, 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 uh, I personally think that in the end, we're going to find that there's some deeper um, issue at play, whether it's part of the Russian invasion activities or it's part of China's rise to power or it's part of the U.S. covering something up. You know, um, as far as I'm concerned, every single party could be guilty. I don't have a particular um, um, dominant theory, but... I, I just cannot believe that this is an accident. No, I think um, I think a lot of people would agree with you on that one. Um, is there anything we, any of us can do to help you, um, listeners of Truth Sentinel, anyone listening to this program, or anyone in general that might hear about your situation and the families? Is there any, anything any of us can do to help you? Uh, would you like to make an appeal about anything? Well, if anybody knows anything at all about how searches for missing airplanes work or radar or cell phone coverage tracking works or um, how we might be able to influence the governments, and I say governments meaning very open-ended, any government to be influenced, to keep the search alive. I mean, th this is not just about the 239 missing passengers. This is about the fact that a major commercial airline has been stolen and, uh, you know, there are 8 million people every single day who fly on commercial airlines. We should all be very, very worried about the fact that one could just disappear. So we need to keep it alive. And, you know, the, the, one, the one tool that we have to organize people into that is the Finding Philip Wood Facebook page. So if, if people could go to that page and like it so that they're following our news feeds and contribute what they know to be true or their connections, you can do so, you know, offline or online, uh, then we'll at least try to keep the story alive and figure out what happened. 
Okay, thank you. I really hope that you do find some answers soon and I hope if anyone is listening that can help, please go to that Facebook page, find in Philip Wood and um, give any information you can. Thanks ever so much for coming on Truth Sentinel today, Sarah. We really appreciate it and uh, we are thinking of you and we really support you and um, if ever you want to come back on, then please do and um, uh, just thank you so much for coming on. Great. Thank you, Scott. Okay, goodbye. So great to talk to Sarah Bajak there. Um, from uh, MH370, we're going to move on to Ukraine. Now, uh, before I do, I just wanted to say that um, I did speak to Sarah uh, before the interview and after the interview, and I'll be putting some of the um, excerpts from that conversation in the next episode, because we talked about a lot more as well. Um, and with her permission, um, I'll put some of that in the next episode. Okay, but um, I also um, want to talk about Ukraine. I'm here, but in Odessa at the moment. Life is continuing fairly as um, as normal, although I have heard reports that some people have started putting barricades on the roads in some areas. Um, some of my friends uh, who live here have started to pack up their things. They're moving out because um, Odessa has been uh, mentioned in the news as a potential target for Putin. It's one of the largest cities in uh, in Ukraine and it's a seaport so um, it definitely is a potential target so I may be starting to move out of here myself soon I'm, I'm just going to see what's going to be happening in the next few days obviously um, developments here are all the time in Ukraine um, since the um, Ukrainian army have been taking part in operation to deal with the takeover of buildings in the east um, whilst here I did have a chance to speak to um, Alexander uh, just a normal Ukrainian based in Odessa. Um, he works on ships. I, I want to speak to normal people um, in, in Ukraine, just people on the streets and get uh, people's opinions. I met Alexander at a wedding party that I stumbled across whilst in Odessa here. So um, Alexander kindly agreed to uh, talk with me. He's a seaman um, from uh, Odessa, so he works on ships. He said that he's um, basically worked in other countries, such as uh, he told me he dr helped dredge the, the Thames or the um, or the part of the Thames nearer the sea, anyway, um, in London. So me and Alexander uh, met um, in a cafe uh, to do this interview. So um, if you hear any noise in the background, that's why. Um, we just come back from a coffee break after having doing the first part of the interview, uh, which um, I may put some parts of that in next week's episode. The the sound quality wasn't just so good, so I'm just putting the second part first of all. So um, we just come back from a coffee break, and uh, here's Alexander. Okay, we're back from our coffee break, and um, the next question I wanted to ask is to go back go back in time a little bit and just ask you before all this happened. What did you think of uh, Yanukovych? Uh, Mr. Yanukovych, ex-president already. I didn't like him, never, because yeah, just he feels like, uh, yeah, maybe it sounds not polite, but he feels like not educated person. I didn't like his actions and I didn't like uh, his party actions. What was what were happening all around Ukraine by covering his uh, political party? So I really don't like Mr. Yanukovych. Do you think there's any chance he'll come back again or try to come back again? Well, I don't really know because there's always chance. Maybe he'll try, but as said Mr. Putin a few weeks ago, politically he's dead. Because even his, uh, the citizens who was voting for him, they said like, yeah, he ran away, we don't like him as well. But not of, not 100% of them, of course. But uh, his party is still alive in Ukraine and uh, they're trying to get back in, uh, in the power, of course. That's normal for a, for a political party. But uh, I believe Mr. Yanukovych will never come back. And um, what do you think of the current president? Uh, the current uh, president... Well, I think he, he got his chair in a really bad, bad time. 
and there's also some questions to him but I think in this time we have to support him because majorly he do well there's some people that would say that he was put there by the EU like he's more of a supporter uh, or they're more of a supporter of him and maybe Yanukovych was was kind of almost Russian uh, what would you say about that? well uh, I wouldn't say he was placed by uh, Euro Union in his chair but that's true, that's understandable he is more pro-European politic than Mr. Yanukovych Yanukovych was completely pro-Russian politic and Ukraine, the country last, I don't know, 15 years maybe always switching from one way to another from Russian way to European way by switching presidents and uh, governments and finally we got pro-European uh, government and of course Russia didn't like it they don't like it yet That's it. Um, do you think any of the problems that we've seen happening what could spread to Odessa at any point well that's that that's possible if we talk about the same situation like we have in uh, Eastern Europe nowadays that's still possible only we have to understand what the people in Eastern Europe uh, they are mixed with uh, that's just my opinion they are mixed with the Russian let's say secret service uh, officers or something to to make a bit messy situation and uh, bring up the people for striking against Ukraine and eastern part of Ukraine was always pro-Russian always and that's more easy to do over there than in Odessa because Odessa like 50-50 by, by my view and in Odessa they will always have problems I mean the Russians will have always problems with pro-Ukrainian part of Odessa but that's still possible do you think something good could come out of this situation or do you think it's gonna end in uh, something bad well uh, for now there's one thing what I see from this really bad situation that Ukraine got really Ukrainian nation the people become more Ukrainians who feels like Ukrainians because I live in Odessa already for 12 years I never seen so many Ukrainian flags and it feels like Ukrainian city it makes me happy but uh, all the rest it's really bad and uh, it's almost civil war in Eastern Europe almost it's not yet but it's almost Okay, thank you very much for speaking to us today, uh, Alexander, and um, maybe you'll come back and speak to us again um, later on as things develop. Yeah, you're always welcome to ask me some questions. I'm always ready to answer. Thank you. So thanks again to Alexander, and we'll be having more interviews uh, whilst in Ukraine. Um, we'll be checking in with Anthony next week as well. I think he might be doing a review or an interview with someone. Um, there has been um, a lot of alarming talk in the uh, news about weather lately. Um, so I'm going to be keeping an eye on that too. What's the sudden increase in uh, reporting uh, on weather pollution and um, some strange weather phenomenon? Um, something seems to be up to me. I don't know. What do you think? Um, Basically, also, um, next episode we'll be talking about lots of other subjects. Um, the sort of subjects we'll be covering in, in general will be all kinds of um, interesting news about mysteries, um, paranormal activities. Um, we'll be covering topics such as uh, the typical um, conspiracy theories like 9-11, uh, we're looking at sound weapons, um, the Illuminati, genetic engineering, looking at p potential for World War Three. Obviously, this is a uh, potential in Ukraine here as well. Um, if you have any comments or any um, anything you want us to talk about, please remember to put them in the comments section. Please check out our new Twitter page. 
uh, which is now up and running. Um, I have this week listened to um, Caravan to Midnight with John B. Wells, uh, Hagman and Hagman, Alex Jones. Um, John B. Wells' um, episode was quite good. I um, can't remember the lady's name. He was also talking, they were also talking about MH370, and this lady had a theory about that. It sounded reasonably credible because it wasn't too, um, it wasn't too crazy. It was just kind of like basically that, um, the Chinese, when they released their original um, satellite image, that was actually the correct uh, location of the plane. But then they diverted attention to another area because they were trying to cover something up there. Anyway, I don't know where she got her information from. Um, so, uh, also, we're always looking for sponsors, advertisers, anyone who would like to finance this channel because at the moment it's run on a zero uh, budget. And I, I've been making some uh, inroads into trying to, to find uh, sponsorship so we can uh, do more research and actually dedicate time to doing this full time and travel around because um, I do have a, a day job as well. Thanks again for listening um, and thanks again for the positive comments you uh, always seem to leave. Um, catch you later. Have a good week.